This is painful. It's difficult to realize that I spent a lot of time believing something that I now think is incorrect. And if I ever become a Christian again, I know that I would feel that same way. If I have to go through this whole thing again, I don't want to be angry. Welcome to Voices of Deconversion. We share the inspirational stories of deconversion told by former Christians who are now atheist or agnostic. Our stories remind us we're in it together. They encourage us as we discover who we are and help us to embrace who we become. Now here's Steve with today's guest. My guest today is a Puerto Rican atheist who was raised in both Latin America and the United States, having lived in Panama, Colombia, Honduras, North Carolina, and Georgia. He is a Pathos blogger whose blog is named Sin God and is a member of the board of directors of HAFRI, the Hispanic American Freethinkers, a national nonprofit organization that serves as a resource for Hispanic freethinkers and nonbelievers. In addition, he is one of the administrators of the Secular Latino Alliance. His goal as an atheist and Hispanic activist is to fight to increase awareness of Hispanic nonbelievers and to increase the number of opportunities that Hispanic nonbelievers have to be heard by other members of the secular community as speakers and organizers. It's my privilege to welcome Luciano Gonzalez. Luciano, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about this. Cool. Tell me about the Hispanic American Freethinkers, if you know how it started, and then how your involvement with it started. So it's a few years old now, and a lot of what we want to do, and a lot of the um, one of the main reasons that we got started is that Hispanic American non-believers have been around for a while. We're nothing new, but for a long time we have been. I'm not going to say that there's anything deliberate, but we haven't really been recognized in the greater secular community of the United States. And one of the objectives of Hafri is to combat that. It's to work to increase opportunities for Hispanics in the United States who don't believe and who want to be a part of the conversation that free thinkers, atheists, agnostics, and otherwise skeptical people all over the country are having. Okay, cool. Um, and you're on the board of directors, so you're really closely involved with it, it sounds like. Yeah, I am. Cool. And then also, uh, I want to ask about the Secular Latino Alliance. So um, I guess, how is that different? The Secular Latino Alliance is different in, I feel that it's more digital. It's more online, whereas Hafri has groups of people who meet all over the country, and they actually physically get together, and they talk about issues that are important. They they meet mostly in the Washington, D.C. area, but there are smaller groups in other parts of the country. And the Secular Latino Alliance is a younger group that was started by one of my good friends, Sal, after he had a bad experience with another Hispanic uh, secular group. Okay. He wanted to start one, and he wanted to improve the quality, and then he started it with some of the people from the first group, and then he heard about me because I had been working hard to make a name for myself in our community online. Okay. And he was introduced by a mutual friend of ours, and we connected, and he asked me to come on and join them. Cool. Awesome. So you said that you consider yourself an atheist, so why do you use the term atheist? I use the term atheist partially so that people will come up to me and ask me questions about it, because I think I think that's a very important part of destigmatizing it and humanizing people, especially in Latin America, who don't believe in God or gods. Yeah, I think that's really important. I that's a very common answer uh, when I ask people that question, and I think that's so important. You know, so that's cool. Um, Describe to me like what your religious environment was as a childhood growing up and how Christianity influenced you. So I grew up as a fairly moderate Catholic for the first few years of my life. My parents are Puerto Rican veterans, and I was born in North Carolina. By the time I became a Christian as opposed to a Catholic, by the time I became a non-denominational conservative Christian, I was around 13, and my parents at that point in my life had sent me to a Christian school. 
I say Christian school as opposed to Catholic school because this happened in the United States. It was in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and that environment really affected me because I was starting to really learn about Christianity and Catholicism and Catholicism in Christianity for the first time at that point. Okay, so sorry to interject real quick. So you were 13 years old when you were enrolled in this um, in this Christian school? You said I was 11 when I was first enrolled, but I was 13 when I started becoming active and started really learning about my beliefs. Okay, and so up to that point in your life, Christianity wasn't anything that was very significant, or it was. Or why don't you tell me? Yeah. So what was up to that point in your life? Um, how did how was Christianity a part of your life in the early years? I guess. I, at that point, I had lived in Panama, Colombia, and in North Carolina. So you guys and, have moved around a lot. Yeah, because yeah, my parents are – I've mentioned that they're military. So my dad would get stationed in Latin America, and we'd go with him. So that way we could keep our family together. Mm-hmm. And I had gone to – I had gone to mass on, in all of these different countries, but it was more of a social thing. And I knew that this was a set of beliefs – I knew that there were different kinds of beliefs as well. There were people who didn't believe in God. There were people who believed in different gods. There were people who believed that God had different personality traits. But I I wasn't very conscious of what their beliefs were. So okay. when I was enrolled in the Christian school that I went to, which is named Faithful Christian School, I started actually learning about the Bible. I started learning about the history of Christianity, and it was very interesting to me. And it made me become more of a Christian than a what some Latin Americans call cultural Catholic. Was it a Catholic school that you were going to in Fayetteville? No. I went to a non-denominational Christian school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So how were you different at that point in your life when you were starting to learn about your your faith than like a cultural Christian or a cultural Catholic? So the way I, – I guess I should start this off by defining cultural Catholic, cultural Christian. These are people who are raised in environments where they're not really exposed to anything other than either Catholicism or just another form of Christianity. So they assume that it's the norm. They don't really think that much of it. These are some individuals who might not necessarily believe everything in the Bible, but they consider themselves believers in God. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that. that's what I would think of when I hear that term as well, kind of nominal Christians in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's what you were like uh, at around 11 to 13 years old, and you're learning about the Bible. So kind of what comes next in, in your religious life? Um, how, did, how did your faith develop at that point? The school that I went to taught me conservative Christian values, and I really believe them. Um, it makes sense. I, I remember that other people on this podcast have gone to Christian schools. They've been affected by Christian education. That was the sort of environment that I was in. My mom and dad didn't really disagree with me a whole lot on anything, so we never really talked about it. But I was absorbing the beliefs, which are things like um, marriage is between a man and a woman, abortion is the devil, basically, evolution didn't happen, all that fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just check, check, check them off the list, right? Yeah. And for me, there were other people at my school I'm the only person at that school who has since become an atheist or agnostic, but there were other people at the school who were more moderate in their beliefs. And a lot of them, I actually keep in touch with a few of them, but a Mm -hmm. lot of them are still believers. They're just like, oh yeah, what the school taught me wasn't really what I think the Bible says. So they kind of kept their own beliefs to themselves, you know, their personal beliefs, but what you were taught was just kind of a conservative version of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. And so... I guess tell me tell me about those years in your life you didn't consider yourself nom- a nominal Christian or a cultural Christian. So describe how you were devout, I guess, or how how your faith expressed itself in your life every day. For me, everything was prayer worthy. That was that was one of the big things. Everything made me want to pray. It made me want to learn how to best communicate what I thought the word of God was. And at this point in my life, I'm going to jump forward a couple of years because I think the next important chapters happen when I live in Latin America. Mm -hmm. I would move to Honduras at the very end of 2010. Okay. I would move to Honduras not too long after the Honduran coup, and I would be enrolled in a private, 
overtly secular, but in actuality, moderately Christian school. And it was one of the best schools in Honduras. Okay. And this was where I would learn something that I think would have an effect on me later on in my life. I, you and I were talking about, we were talking before the podcast about how there's levels of acceptance of religion in Latin America, at least in my experience. Mm-hmm. So you can be, you can be overly Christian in Latin America and you will be ostracized for this. So me and some of my friends joke that there's a certain tightrope that you have to walk when you live in Latin America and you're a believer. And for me, I learned this in Honduras because I didn't believe that evolution was a thing that happened. Yeah. And I told my friends about this, and I debated my friends. And of course, your friends, I, at, your friends in Honduras when you're going to school. Yeah. yeah okay. This is like um, ele- is this elementary school age or? This is high school. High school. Okay, so you're in high school, yeah, and you're having these debates with your friends. Yeah, because my teachers are the teachers that we have are teaching us about evolution. They're teaching us modern science. And obviously, it's nothing super advanced, but they are they are teaching us the basics. They're giving us a framework for when we would go to college, mm-hmm. because the school that I went to was an international bachelorette school that was preparing students to go to college in Asia, in Europe, and in the United States. Okay. And so, of course, they had to have a certain framework, and in that framework, they taught things like evolution. They taught the basics of the Big Bang theory. They taught non-creationist history. So I would debate my friends and I would lose. And this is the first time in my life that I would really be exposed to people who not only were not nominal Christians, but actually had beliefs that went against Christianity. That were more secular. Yeah. Yeah. But and that was in high school. So before high school, though, um, how was your faith expressing itself? The thing the thing about my faith is that I was very political. I was I was a very conservative person and I didn't really feel like talking about my religion a whole lot when I was younger. As a matter of fact, I feel like I talk about my atheism on social media a lot more than I did my Catholicism or my Christianity, whichever it was at the time. Mm-hmm. And for me it was interesting because I was a very devout person on the inside, but I didn't always express this vocally to people. Mm-hmm. So I would keep I would actually, I actually did a fairly good job of keeping my religious beliefs a secret, not necessarily a secret, but at the very least, not a major aspect of my personality. Okay. So for me, one of the big things that I did was I read the Bible a lot. I read it. I had actually read it multiple times, front to back, by the time I became an atheist. Really, which isn't... the entire thing. Yeah. Wow, that's 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 a lot of reading. I did that. I, mean, I did that by the time I was in college, but I hadn't done that like when I was younger. That's that's my cool. I mean, that's a lot. Was yeah. my school had Bible classes, which was actually where I learned a lot of the religious beliefs that not not the school in Honduras, but the school when I was in North Carolina had Bible classes, and they actually did encourage you to read the whole Bible. You had to memorize verses, you had to memorize scripture, you had to know the context. Okay, so do you have um, brothers or sisters? I'm an only child. Only child, and your parents were military, so you guys moved around a lot. Um, were you? And I forget if you said this already, so forgive me. Um, but your parents, were they very devout? My parents were moderates. They believed, as far as I could tell. They they enjoyed going to church. They enjoyed the community. They really did. I know that when I told my mom that I was an atheist, I could tell she really did believe. It was the first time that I was 100% sure of it. But from her reaction, I knew that for her, it wasn't just a cultural thing. It was something that she had thought about and had considered. And it wasn't a major part of her life, but it was something that she valued. It's kind of interesting to me because it seems like your parents were, were Christian, you were Christian, but it's almost like you, all of you had your own individual personal faith that in some ways you kept to yourself. Is that fair to say? Yeah. my The only thing that we did very openly, not very openly, but with the three of us was we would pray before we ate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a, like a typical Christian family, you know? Pray before yeah. your meal, that kind of thing. Well, what would you say um, is something that influenced your faith the most as you were growing up, or someone who influenced your faith the most? Hmm. I had very interesting dreams when I was younger, and some in some of them I would interpret the things that I saw as not necessarily the face or the voice of God, but something similarly, something that has similar divine authority. 
And when I had these dreams, I would take them very seriously. One instance that I remember very specifically was that I had a dream that I was told I was going to be sick in a couple of days. And at that point, I was still in the Christian school. So now looking back, I think that my environments influenced the dreams that I had a whole lot. And I went to my principal. My principal told me to relax that I was probably just having a bad dream rather than to be overly concerned. But she herself is very devout. How did you respond to them when you would have these dreams? My initial reaction was always to look for some form of interpretation and then to basically act in a way that reflects the interpretation. The The one where I got sick led to me, or the one where I dreamt that I was going to get sick, led to me acting very healthily. It led to me doing everything I could to avoid being sick. And I didn't get sick three days later, but it still influenced my behavior because I thought it was something that was going to happen. I thought I was seeing the future. Yeah, it's almost like God was giving you a prophecy and, and telling you beforehand something that yeah. would, would happen. Can you think of any other dreams that you had like that? That was that was one of the ones that was the most specific. But in other ones, I just remember seeing not not anything crazy, but I remember seeing like how people thought of heaven. I remember seeing my friends talking to me about religion, and these things would inspire me to study religion more carefully. Even when I was younger, I had a very big interest in mythology. So for me, that was something that I would spend time studying, reading, and writing about. Okay. So like, if you had a dream about heaven, then maybe you'd open the Bible and start learning about what the Bible says on heaven. That yeah. Kind of, that kind of idea. Yeah. Well, um... You said that you read the Bible yourself a lot, and you prayed, you know, everything was worthy to be prayed about. You know, I came from a conservative, uh, like, evangelical, you know, real, like, everybody, it's a relationship, it's not a religion. I mean, that was our whole <laughs> you know, thing. So, what did God, de- so that's why I asked this question, what did God mean to you personally? God, to me, personally, meant someone who made everything okay. So for me, religion was very comforting, and it's it's very interesting to me looking back that I had such an easy time accepting that I was an atheist, because to me, religion was very important. So it, it struck me as odd that when I admitted my atheism for the first time, I was able to do it so easily. Wow. Yeah, that is actually pretty remarkable because my, my experience was, was pretty much the opposite. Like it was pretty devastating to me. So um, and I guess we can talk. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later about like um, how that impacted you and your in your family and stuff, because I think that's always really interesting to hear this time in your life. So what was there anything else that um, was significant up to this point? You, it sounds like when you moved to Honduras, that's when you started getting exposed to some of these other more secular ideas. Um, but up to that point. Was there anything else that's significant that you, you want to mention about about that time in your life? Or This is just a general thing, and I'm sure other military children who were once religious and now aren't or have similar thoughts on it. But religion to me was extremely comforting. It was a constant. It was something that I could count on, especially before I had my own computer, before I had access to all the information online, and before I could contact people who lived very far away from me. It was just a daily thing that I used to feel safe. Okay, and you said it makes it made it like God made it okay. He made everything okay. What do you mean by that? I mean, as a military child, and different military children react to loneliness in different ways. But I despise loneliness as a kid. It's something. It's a personality trait of mine that's changed now. But as a little kid, I wanted constant things. I didn't want change. I didn't want to be the new kid in school, but I thought that because of my religion, everything would be better, I guess. So you, you wanted things you you just mean like, like, um, you wanted people around you or do you mean like you just, you wanted, uh, I guess things to interact with stuff to do. It was a little bit of both Yeah. in the way that it is with most kids. So how would God make that okay? So how you know how does God make that situation better for you when you're when you're younger? Part of it was that I was conscious that Christianity was common. In all the places that I lived in, I knew that I had even even if I was a different kind of Christian than the people I was surrounded by, I still had a conscious awareness that Christianity at the very least at its most basic was something very common in the places that I lived. So if I ever needed a way to connect with someone, I could be like, hey, what church do you go to? 
okay. I could ask them about their beliefs, and I knew that we had a little bit of something in common. Okay, so the loneliness was made better as a military child. The loneliness was made better with this knowledge that there's kind of a common thing that everybody has that everybody shares in your community. And that's, and that's your, your, your Christianity, your faith. Is that, is that what you're saying? Okay. So you talked about then that you went to, you, you guys had to move again to Honduras and this is when you're becoming exposed to evolution and more secular ideas. So tell me about that time in your life and how that began to change things for you. So things were moving to Honduras was a big was a big shock for a variety of reasons. But looking back, one of the biggest ones was that it was the first place any notions of Christianity that I had were challenged. Because even even when I left the Christian school that I was in and I was still in North Carolina, the other people around me had similar beliefs. And the people that didn't didn't publicly state their beliefs. So no one felt the need to challenge anyone, and everyone's beliefs just went untested. But then when I moved to Honduras, there were people who were willing to challenge me. And I know it sounds weird that I've described the school that I went to as a, as a quietly Christian school, despite the fact that it had secular ideas. But in the school that I went to, there was a Bible reading club. There were, and that was basically the equivalent of the Good News Club in the United States, but it was in Spanish. So okay, so this in Honduras at this school, it was a it was a Bible reading cl- club. So yeah. after school, you guys would get together and and read Bible verses. And we would do it during lunch as well. There were people who built communities. There were teachers who openly talked about the goodness of the Bible, which is and there's nothing wrong with that. But the idea that that's something that would happen in a fully secular school is questionable at best. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, um, do you think it differs a lot in in Honduras and maybe in other countries that are Latin American countries, the the separation of church and state, the ch- separation of religion from, you know, from the school day for for kids, you know, going through school. Um, do you feel like there's there's a big difference between you know being in a United States school versus being in a Honduras school, in that regard? I feel like there was, and part of the reason why I think this is. In, in Latin American schools, everyone shares the religious beliefs in common. And the simple reality is that you're not going to hear reports of students being bullied because of their religious beliefs like you do in North Carolina in Latin America because lots of students don't have differing religious beliefs. I mentioned North Carolina because when I first – like a year after I first admitted that I was an atheist, I remember there was a girl who tried to start a secular club at her school. And the school opposed it. She was bullied. She had to fight long and hard. I think that she succeeded in the end, but she had to fight tooth and nail for it. And she was a high school student. That's simply not something that's going to happen in Honduras or in Colombia or in Panama. The thing that won't happen, you mean, is that someone would never start a club like that? Yeah. Okay, so do you think they're more devout in in Honduras and in Latin American countries? I'm not entirely sure because my experience, part of it is the fact that I am well aware that I am limited in my frame of reference. I went to a private school and Honduras is a very dangerous, very religious country, but I went to a school that was very American. I went to a school that had lots of rich kids. I worked in the embassy. I'm not going to act like I went out into the countryside and that I saw what was going on in the public schools because I didn't. So in in America, you know, in in North Carolina school, someone's vocal about their being secular and they want to start a secular club and that um that is met with opposition from, you know, from Christians in the school. In Honduras, she said that would never have happened. No one would even have brought something like that up. Do you think it's because those people who are secular are more quiet in in Honduras, or do you think that they just don't exist, or they they're not as common? They definitely exist, and and I know this for a fact because I have written articles about Honduran atheists. Oh, I've written okay. articles about Honduran atheists, Ecuadorian atheists, and Colombian and Argentinian atheists because they're small, but the things that are going on in their communities are real. 
there there's a very there's a not a very large but a moderately sized atheist community in Honduras that's actually fighting for more secularism they're organizing they're getting together they have a group on Facebook I talk with some of them I've written articles about them because I admire what they're doing yeah. having lived in Honduras I know I can imagine the sort of pressure that they would be under to not be vocal about their irreligion. What do you think they fear if they come out and they're more vocal? I don't know what they fear because they're they're taking every opportunity. And it's it's amazing to me because I've seen similar things happening in Colombia, but Colombia is a secular state. They have a separation of church and state in their constitution. And Honduras has a mention of the separation of church and state, but it doesn't have an actual explicit part of their constitution aside from the fact that it says that priests shouldn't run for office interesting so do you think so honduras um the government do you think it kind of promotes christianity then you're talking about that te- yeah you're talking about that teacher who kind of was saying the bible's a, a good book do you think the government promotes it the government the government definitely uses christian sentiment the honduran in Honduras, the leading party is the National Party of Honduras, which is their conservative, moderately Christian party. They definitely have Christian ideals. They have very Catholic ideals. But they most of their politicians don't go out of their way unless they feel like invoking that idea. I know the president has. I know a few of the leaders have. But most politicians are... They're not overly Christian. They're not obnoxiously Christian, at the very least. Up to this point, you know, you're you're in high school. You're in high school in Honduras, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, can you identify a time when you begin to start to doubt some of your beliefs? It was it was the conversation that I mentioned with you earlier. Uh, it was where I was talking about how I didn't believe in evolution. That was probably the first time in my entire life that one of my religious beliefs was seriously questioned and ridiculed and I didn't feel super sad about it I didn't feel like insulted or anything but it made me realize that I was probably wrong about this position and that made me wonder what other positions I was wrong in Hmm. okay so what did you so what did you do with that so you were you know um kind of confronted with this different idea and it and you felt like you kind of lost the argument when your friends would have these discussions with you. How did you handle that? I mean, what, um, how did you process it? What did you do, you know, following those discussions? For me, it was, it was important that I realized that if I was wrong, I needed to know. So I did start to research this and it wouldn't, I I would be a Christian until I came to college. But at that point, everything was starting to change for me. Additionally, at that time, my political identity was starting to emerge. And my political identity and my religious identity as a Christian were very intertwined. So for me, the more I started to learn, the more moderate I started to become in both religion and politics. Okay, yeah, because like in North Carolina, it's very – well, traditionally has been conservative. Yeah. Being a conservative Christian, which it sounds like you were – you know, Republican, conservative, Christian, it all kind of goes together. Yeah. So things start to moderate for you. Uh, Do you remember, like, um, evolution was an issue? Were there any other issues that that got raised that caused you to doubt or question what you what you'd been believing? Abortion. So the those are the big two for me. But those are the two that led me down the rabbit hole, so to speak. So in Honduras, the reason why I talk about this now in the context of Honduras Mm -hmm. is that Honduras has an absolute ban on abortion. Uh And that actually came into being while I was still living in Honduras. That wasn't the way that it had been before. But by the time I left, there was a complete and utter ban on abortion. Everything from actual abortion to plan B pills. Wow. So it's just completely banned. And that happened when you were there. Do you think that had an impact then on on you questioning your faith? It did because people people in my social circles, people on my social media were having debates about this at the time that it was going on. People were talking about how abortion should be legalized, especially in especially in a situation where it's completely outlawed. People realize just how terrible 
completely outlying it as because that's just a bad idea. Right, because if there's an extreme circumstance of, you know, rape or incest or something like that, like, um, those are most people, I mean, even a lot of Christians are, are I guess, more open to, to the idea of abortion in a circumstance like that or the life of the mother's at stake or something. Um, so, yeah, complete ban. Uh, it's almost like when the other side goes so extreme, it kind of brings the moderates out and makes the moderates be a little bit more extreme on the other end sometimes. And it sounds yeah. like it almost had that effect on you where the the government comes down and says, OK, nope, complete ban on this. And you're you know, people and you're talking to your friends and things and you're kind of uh, realizing like this is uh this is really extreme. This is a really extreme stance to be taking. And it makes you start to question what you've believed all this time. And so, so then you kind of walk down that path and, and uh, was it very quick that you were like, okay, you know, I'm fine with abortion now, or um, did it take you a while to, to kind of be comfortable with the idea? I, I was, I very quickly became okay with the idea in circumstances. It would take, it would take a little while for me to be completely okay with the idea of it just in general. And for me to start to, destigmatize abortion because my family was and still probably is at least somewhat anti-abortion and the people i surrounded myself with were just like yeah abortion's bad we're not saying it should be illegal but it's definitely bad so even when i thought of it as being nothing more than a medical procedure i still had a certain level of stigma against it so it would take a little while for me to unlearn that stigma okay and um your faith is kind of slowly, it seems like being chipped away at a little bit. Did you recognize that? I was I was starting to learn it by the time I would go to college. There's a very short period in between Honduras and college where I lived in Georgia. Nothing really important, at the very least in terms of my religious beliefs, happened at that point. It was only for a semester. And then I would be at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and I'm about to graduate from there in two weeks. Cool. Congratulations, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so when you got to college, that's when it sounds like your 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 doubts or your questions really kind of came to a turning point. So yeah. what, what was that turning point for you? I've, I've been on other podcasts, and I've very briefly mentioned this, but I think this is going to be the first time I've ever had a real conversation where I talk about it. So there's an event... I'm sure you've probably heard of it since you were well aware of Christianity and all the popular trends with Christianity. There's a thing called Winter Jam, and it's it's just a concert where they have a whole bunch of Christian artists that get together. They tour the Bible Belt and a few other states. They came to North Carolina in the second semester of my freshman year, and I went to their concert, and they told me about a movie named God's Not Dead. Oh, I've heard of this movie. <laughs> My 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 experience with Christian concerts back in the day, there was this event called Creation, and it was like called the Creation Concert, and um, it was like all my favorite Christian bands would go to this this really great venue in um, in Eastern Washington. It's like this this gorge um, by the um, Columbia River, and and it's beautiful setting, and it was just like such an awesome experience to go and like hear all the music and everything. But yeah, back in my back in like when I was listening to Christian music and stuff, it was that was what it was called. But this this one's called Winter Jam. Yep. Okay, and it's the same idea. It's though. still around. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> at Winter Jam, now where is this held at? Like um like fairgrounds or something or? This was actually this particular Winter Jam. I've gone to three in my life. This would be the second. But the new boys came, and it was in Greensboro, so it was, like, right next to my university. And I took my girlfriend because she was also a Catholic. She's not a Catholic anymore. But she and I were both Christians. Mm -hmm. I was not denominational. She was Catholic. And we went. We really enjoyed the concert. And the new the new boys, Newsboys? I think is the name of the band, yeah, Newsboys, they yeah. would advertise this movie. We went to go and see the movie. And in by the time the movie was over, I realized I was an atheist because the movie, like I know that sounds really like explosive, but it was just <laughs> if you've never seen it, it's a really bad movie. I was gonna say I bet it's not a very good movie. <laughs> the reason why I decided then and there that I could no longer call myself a Christian and that I was an atheist was because that movie did present the logical conclusion to Christianity. 
in the movie, there's this professor named Professor Radisson. He's the antagonist. He is a misotheist who pretended to be an atheist, and he's challenged by the main character. He loses the debate. He admits that he hates God. He runs off and he gets hit by a car. And he is told that he's going to die no matter what. So he either has the choice to become a Christian and go to heaven or die and go to the other place. So cheesy. <laughs> you, you can guess which one he decides to do, by oh. the way, he becomes a Christian. Yeah, I was going to say, probably, it has to end happy, right? So he accepts God and then he passes away. Yeah. But he goes to heaven, so it's all better. Somebody oh. died. It's okay because they're in heaven. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So you you said a second ago the logical end to Christianity. What what did you mean by that? The, this differs from Christian group to Christian group. But the Christian groups that I were raised with are just like if you're not a Christian, unless you are a baby when you die, you're going to hell. And that movie presented that absolute end to Professor Radisson. It was just like you can either die and go to hell or you can die and go to heaven so yeah just the the black and white world of either you're with us or you're against us either you've chosen god or you have there's no middle ground you're either going to heaven you're going to hell it's just boom you know yeah what about that in the movie uh bothered you a lot of the people that i know are christian like to tiptoe around this and and it's a logical thing to tiptoe around because you don't want to think about the fact that a lot of the people that you care about, whether you know it or not, are going to go to hell because they're not Christians. Yeah. And that movie just – the one good thing about that movie is it really does destroy the idea that you can tiptoe around this if you are a Christian. Okay. So it's a fundamentalist – we would say fundamentalist, but they would probably say conservative Christian – movie that really tries to drive home the point like no 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 it comes down to this either you accept jesus or you're going to hell i mean it's very conservative in that in that way it sounds yeah. like okay so when you saw that how did you internally how were you responding like what were you thinking when you were watching this unfold on the movie screen i feel like watching i feel like over the course of the movie i could feel like my entire religious life at that point started off as someone who's like yeah I'm a believer. I'm a real believer. But then by the end, I'm just like, I'm trying to challenge this. And then by the end, it's forced down my throat. So for me, it's just, I couldn't vibe with it. And at that point, my faith was already, I'm going to be honest, at that point, my faith was so weak. I, I was hoping that the movie would revitalize my beliefs. And in the end, it's just like, oh. no, this is, I can't really get around this, even if I want to. That's, I find that so interesting that, I I think this is really common when people's beliefs as Christians are challenged. They don't just like, a lot of times, I just people go back and they try to, they go back to God and try to reinforce those beliefs and they try to find something else that's going to help them realize, no, 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 it's okay. You know, what you believe is correct and, and you believe the right thing or whatever. It's not like at the first sign of difficulty or the first sign of doubt that you just were like, oh, all right, I guess it's all pretend, you know, y you were trying. In, in other words, yeah. that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like um, when I went through some things in my personal life, as far as my deconversion goes, when when bad things happened to me, I didn't just up and go, OK, well, God must not be real. I wondered, like, why isn't God talking to me or whatever? But it drove me back to him. And it sounds like that's kind of what you were doing in that moment. You were going to this movie kind of, you know, maybe um, subconsciously hoping that, that maybe it'll kind of help reinforce some of those beliefs. It wasn't subconscious for me. Like, <laughs> my, girlfriend wouldn't my girlfriend wouldn't talk. She talked to me about religion, but it was very difficult because I, I became an agnostic or no, I became an atheist a long time before she did. And in the beginning, we would have lots of fights. Even before we first went to Winter Jam, at that point, I was already having my doubts. At that point, I had already started learning about atheism. I knew very okay. little about atheism. And by atheism, I mean movement atheism. I don't mean like atheism as in you lack a belief. You mean like the, like the organizations that are out there that are politically political organizations that are pro atheist. Yeah. 
Okay, so you were becoming aware of those kind of before this movie and before you went to this movie. I I had already started doing research because I did – I had always wanted to be a defender of the things that I believed in. When I believe in something, for me, I believe in it very passionately. So I wanted – I didn't want to just be someone who's like, oh, yeah, I believe, but I'm not going to like – I'm not going to do anything with this belief. Sounds like you were researching atheism so that you could better understand it and thereby maybe argue against it. I was at the, I was curious about it, and I think that the motive was so that I could have conversations with atheists and so that I could explain why atheism was not as good a worldview in yeah. simple terms as Christianity. Okay, well, it makes sense to me. I mean, you were trying to kind of understand the the opposing viewpoint, which is a very admirable thing to do, and I don't think a lot of people do that in in life in general, politically, or, you know, even when we're in an argument with someone that we care about, we don't often want to know what it's like from their perspective. So that's, that's, you know, admirable that you were willing to kind of research it and look into that. Yeah. So your girlfriend, did you guys talk about the movie? How, how was, how did she respond? And did you talk to her about it right after the movie? She didn't like it. She had similar problems that I did with the movie, but for her, it wasn't, I don't think that it was as extreme for her because I don't think that she was as religious at her height of religiosity. I don't think that she cared about religion as much as I did, which makes sense, especially as Latin Americans, especially in the United States. We have more problems to worry about than religion. Hmm. So did you guys didn't really talk too much about it after after the movie then or we talked about it? We would have fairly extensive conversations between the two of us, which oftentimes led to arguments and in some cases very heated arguments because we are both when we care about something we're both very passionate about what we care about and at that point i'm a history major i've been a history major the entire time i've been at uncg i already knew a lot about the history of catholicism and a decent amount about the history of christianity aside from catholicism at this point so i was already well aware of arguments against catholicism and against the catholic church And to me, I was able to use those effectively because she was a Spanish major and we were able to have conversations. Both of us learned new things because of our conversations. And in the end, she would eventually become an agnostic person, although I don't know exactly when she realized that she was agnostic. Okay, that's, you know, it's really funny because this movie was made probably to help convince people to scare people into believing, essentially. You know, I mean, they want they want you to feel like that, that what well, like professor, whoever it was that was dying and had to decide, you know, one way or the other, you're going to choose God or not. You know, they want to scare you into thinking, oh, my goodness, what if I get hit by a car or what if lightning strikes me and like I haven't confessed to my sins, you know, and it has the exact opposite effect. It makes people go, OK, that's that's like too much. You know, that that's not real life. You know, that's not fair to put people in a position like that. I don't know. I mean, those are my feelings. I mean, did you feel similarly then? I mean, obviously I did. But the thing is, I have friends who went and saw the movie. I'm not going to say their faith was like reaffirmed because of it, but they enjoyed the movie, not just in terms of like, oh, hey, this is a good movie. But they also thought that it had good life lessons. And I remember that like the one of the main premises of the movie's end is basically you're not promised tomorrow. Yeah. So you better you better be right with Jesus today because you're not promised tomorrow. I just feel like that's such an uncompassionate way of thinking about God, you know, like thought god was supposed to be forgiving and understanding of people's circumstances and it's i don't know it's just such a black and white world it's hard to understand now that i've been away from it for a while you know yeah but um so all right you come out of this movie you're atheist now i mean it's like that did it for you it was kind of building up but that was kind of the the final straw um and your girlfriend's sort of going through maybe a longer journey but a similar journey to yours you were at college, so this is probably a really great place to be losing your faith because, in a sense, because you're surrounded by a lot of people who are academic. You can you can have these discussions. You probably could connect with other atheists if you wanted to. Um, but were there people like your family, close friends that were that you had to tell um, or that you did tell that you were atheist? 
the minute I became an atheist, I was immediately consciously aware that there are not a lot of Hispanic atheists. Obviously, this is something that I was aware of prior to this, but it didn't matter to me. Right, because you were Christian. There's a lot of Christian or Catholic, uh, you know, Hispanics. At that point, you fit in, and then you become an atheist, and you become aware that there's not as many Hispanic atheists. So, I mean, I guess, how did that make you feel, and and what did you do about it? I decided that I was going to be vocal, partially because, as I already mentioned, I when I think about a position and I consciously consider it, I will defend it, and I'll talk about it publicly, but also because... I felt alone, and I knew that if I ever had the opportunity to make other people like me, not just Hispanics, but other minority groups within the secular community, independent of their race or ethnicity, I don't want them to feel alone. So I figure that the best way, especially in North Carolina, the best way to get people to come to me and be like, hey, I like the stuff that you're doing. I don't feel as alone because I know that there's someone else in a similar situation is to be public about it. Were, were you able to very quickly find other Hispanics that were a- atheist or agnostic? No. <laughs> I was able to find I was able to find a few minority skeptics within the U.S. population. I have more than a few friends who are Asian American who are non-believers. Um, I've met a couple of Arabs who are minorities, whether they're Christian or other religious minorities within their greater community. But it would be over an entire year of me being an atheist who was vocal about atheism before I would meet the first person that I would meet who's Hispanic and also a non-believer. So it sounds like you were very vocal right from the beginning. So you, you saw the movie and it was like, I'm an atheist now. That's that. And you became vocal immediately. Relatively speaking, Not, you know. Relatively speaking, yeah. It would. I think I was on Time Hop the other day, and I actually saw my first ever status that I made as an atheist. So it was in April, and that was about a month after I saw the movie. So yeah, how long ago was yeah. this then? Because you're you're a senior in at North Carolina mm-hmm. Greensboro. Yeah. So how it's how many years three ago? Years. Three years. Okay. So not that long ago, really. Yeah. So you were looking at, I don't even know what Time Hop is. <laughs> Time Hop is, it's an app where like it compiles all your Facebook posts and oh. all your tweets from a year ago. And then you click on it. It's like, oh, hey, this is what you posted a year ago. Oh, yeah. uh, that happens to me on Facebook just automatically. It just pops up. Well, like, yeah. yeah, now. <laughs> oh, now. Okay. But back then yeah. it didn't. Okay. Um, you didn't have a lot of family or, or close religious friends that had a problem with, with your atheism? I... I have a kind of funny story, it's funny to me anyway, about my family when it came to my atheism. My mom was very surprised. I don't know I don't know when I told my dad. I don't know the exact moment that I told him, but I remember when I told my mom. And we were driving in the car. It was that summer, actually. We were driving in the car. I was home from college. And my mom was asking me about religion. She's just like, oh, what church do you go to oh. in Greensboro? And I told her, I was like, I'm an atheist. And she just looks at me and she's like, you went to a Christian school. You were the most religious person in our house. And I was like, yeah, I'm not anymore. And it would it would be a couple of days. It, it wasn't an immediate thing where she was just okay with it. But she wasn't, she wasn't mean about it. She just had a lot of questions. Okay. Well, I mean, that's really fortunate. That's, were you, were you scared to tell her? Were you afraid to tell her? I had made a mental deal with myself that I wasn't going to be the first person to bring up religion, but she did. So I was like, okay, I guess this is just, I don't know, the universe's way of telling me that I should probably mention not a believer. It's better to get it out in the open. I mean, it took me, it took me, I don't know, a year and a half maybe before I told anybody other than my wife and one close friend who had found out in the meantime, but I was terrified that someone would ask because I had gone, you know, I was in the middle of getting my biblical the studies degree. You know, I was going to be a pastor and yeah. like, then all of a sudden I'm an atheist. Like that's shocking. So I was, and I was embarrassed kind of too, like here I've gone into debt, you know, I've gotten this degree and it's like, how do you tell someone? But so I'm envious that you had such a, um, I don't know. Is it fair to call it an easy, <laughs> an easy time telling family? Do you, do you think it was it wasn't too traumatic? Wasn't too difficult? I had an easy time telling my mom, 
And it wasn't easy right afterwards. My mom bombarded me with questions in the car. She was kind of, she was a little bit awkward around me the first few days, but she very quickly, she accepted a lot faster than I had any right to expect her to, because that's, that's a bombshell to drop. Yeah. When you've gone to a Christian school, you were raised in Central America. What kind of questions was she asking you? She she was just asking me, like, I feel like at first she was a little bit upset because she, she had invested money in one overtly Christian school. Another one that was more Christian than secular, but it was still like a fairly secular school. She thought of me as a Christian churchgoer, and I just told her that I wasn't. And in her defense... That is a big thing to drop on someone. Mm Mm-hmm. It is. You mentioned not being able to find other Hispanic atheists, and you you felt alone. So how did you you get through that period of time where you felt so alone, and you felt like you were the only Hispanic atheist you knew? What got you through that time? What got me through that time was videos of people that I strongly disagree with now. (laughs) Which which is a quirky thing to say, but I'm I'm going to frame this so that it makes a little bit more sense. The first atheist I ever saw was the Amazing Atheist. Okay. I don't know too much about the Amazing Atheist, so you'll have to tell me. The Amazing Atheist is... I'm not going to say that he's a bad person or not, but he, he's a highly controversial atheist who has very strong opinions on a very wide variety of things. And he was the most popular atheist online at that time, because at that time I didn't know about the friendly atheist. I'm not entirely sure if in, I think this was around the time the friendly atheist was starting the blog that he runs now Mm -hmm. on Patheos and all of this stuff. And at this point, TJ, the amazing atheist was already kind of established. If you Googled atheists, he would be the first person you'd come across. Okay, you say you disagree with some stuff he says now, but at the time, that helped you? It did, because I only watched his religion videos. That's that's what I do with a lot of uh, YouTube atheists whose work I largely enjoy, because when they talk about religion, they talk about it well. Okay, so that helped you. What about it helped you? Knowing that there were other people who were thinking the same things that I was thinking, that there was an online community that already existed, even if it wasn't a very, a very diverse in the most simplistic way in terms of like ethnicity and race, it it helped because I knew that if I wanted to talk to other atheists, I could go online and I could start creating content, which eventually is what exactly what I would do. What drove you to? want to seek out other Hispanic atheists, other Hispanic non-believers. What were you looking for? What what more did you need? I feel like the fact that I was raised in Latin America, as opposed to having been raised in the United States, is probably the biggest factor. And I, that's a weird thing to say, given that I spent my childhood almost equally between Latin America and the United States. But I felt, especially by the time I left Honduras, I felt way more connected to Latin America than I did to the United States. So when I would become, when I would accept my atheism, I I needed to know that there were other people like me. And not, and I don't mean like me in the most simplest ways, that there are other people who agree with my ideas. That's part of the reason why I think it mattered that I was looking for people who had similar backgrounds. So you were looking for um, people who had, like you said, similar backgrounds. They were maybe from Latin America or they spoke Spanish or they they shared a common history is kind of what you're saying. Yeah. So what was the most helpful then to you during this time of your life? Um, Or maybe I should just ask, so who, who were some of the first Hispanic atheists that you came across? The very first Hispanic atheist that I came across was the founder of the Secular Latino Alliance. He sent me a message because... There, there's an atheist activist named Johnny Brotherton, still active. He, uh, he introduced the two of us because we came across each other on one of his threads, and we're both like, oh hey, we're both Hispanic. And apparently, Sal would tell me later on that he'd go, he'd add me on Facebook, I'd accept the friend request, and then a couple of days later, he, I was debating someone about religion, and he saw me standing my ground. Oh, okay. I wasn't being, yeah, I wasn't being like the nicest person in the world, but I also wasn't being like ultra rude, but I was stating definitively that I was an atheist and why. And he's like, hey, 
he he really liked what he saw, especially because I was a young person. And he's just like, hey, do you want to come and help me moderate this community that I'm making? And I accepted. The founder of the Secular Latino Alliance basically reached out to you. And what's his name again? Sal Via Real. And so he, he offered to let you kind of be a part of the Secular Latino Alliance? He asked me to come on as one of their administrators. And I, I immediately accepted because I saw Secular, I saw Latino, and I saw Alliance. And I was like, this is what I've been waiting for in the last year that I've been writing and talking and just being an out atheist. That's really cool. Um, it, so how big is the Secular Latino Alliance? We have over 2,000 members. Very cool. 2,000 people. Wow. And you're an administrator online. So that just mean like you moderate stuff or like you can like, um, you can send out messages and information to people in the group. Um, I help organize I help organize us as much as we can, but there are only a few places where we have gotten groups that have gotten together and that are like sitting down, meeting physically. And it's okay. because a lot of us live in very different places. We not only have people in the United States, we also have people in Latin America. And that has only been going on for last year, you said? The secular... That's been going on since late 2015. Wow, that's so new. So, yeah. and it's a younger group. You said it's mostly younger younger people. It's right? younger than, aside from atheists in Latin America, it's the youngest group that I've heard of. It's younger than any group in Puerto Rico and younger than any group in the mainland United States for Hispanic non-believers. Wow. That probably helped you a ton to get engaged in a group that was promoting, you know, secularism, but also that shared a common history um, that you had that probably yeah. helped you a lot, right? I feel like saying that it changed my life sounds melodramatic, but it's literally true because later on, I would find out that I, w I would write for free thought blogs for a little bit. I still have an account there. When I graduate from college, I want to write, I want to start it up again, but I also have a Patheos blog. And in the free thought blogs, one of the main reasons why I was asked to join is because I was their first Hispanic person. And for a lot of people, that's going to sound frustrating. But the reality is that, that representation matters, not just to me, but because there are religious beliefs in Latin America that aren't in other places that need to be talked about, that need to be publicized that need to be analyzed and the only way we can do this is if we invite people who know about these religious beliefs these traditions these myths and have them write and talk about these things what do you mean that for some people it's frustrating i write for patheos and i wrote an article about the need for diversity in skeptical conferences i can tell that you can imagine how that was received it's shocking to me that people in the secular community would uh, not be on board with diverse speakers. What you're saying is basically they did not receive what you wrote very well. Most of the people who read what I wrote really enjoyed it. Not everyone did. And mo very interestingly to me, one of the people who didn't like it was a Latino. Oh. And this is a person who has a track record. He's an atheist. He, he has a record of doing the same sort of thing. And his argument has its merits. He says that diversity in terms of race and ethnicity is the simplest kind of diversity, and it is kind of superficial. And the reality is that there's an extent to which that's true. But the idea that people of color experience religion the same as even other different people of color is ridiculous. And that's something that needs to be acknowledged, which is one of the main reasons why I wrote that we need more diversity, including of the most superficial kind. Because I wrote I wrote a response to him, and I'm just like, I told his, his origin story of him becoming an atheist is very different. He read atheist works, and books by like Christopher Hitchens and other such authors, and that was what led to him becoming an atheist. That wasn't what led to me becoming an atheist. And to me, like, even that diversity really matters. Yeah, I think so. That's why I want to have a, a variety of guests on this show, because I do think that we experience things differently. So you've, you've obviously talked about a lot of different ways that your, your experience was unique, uh, being having lived in Latin America. But you said um, it's ridiculous that 
people think that it's that it's not different, that it's all the same. Maybe explain to me in what ways do you think someone who's lived in Latin America or someone like yourself who's Hispanic experiences religion differently? How is it different from, um, you know, a white American man, you know, who's, who's going through, uh, you know, who's religious? I feel like one of the biggest differences, and this difference is minimized if you live in, say, the Bible Belt, like I do. But one of the biggest differences is just the pure level of acceptance that religion has in pub- in modern society. I got to visit California with my girlfriend, and it was the first time I ever left. It was the first time I ever left the East Coast without going to a different country, and that's a whole different world from North Carolina. And I was there for a full month. People people don't talk about religion. Even Latinos don't talk about religion in California. And it was it was crazy to me because that wasn't the way the things are in Latin America. In Latin America, being religious isn't – I feel like people think it's more important than it actually is, but it's still normalized and it's still expected. So to see those different places where different people have largely different attitudes towards religion is very different. I can assure you – obviously, and you know this, a man from Florida who is raised by religious parents in Florida is going to have a different experience from someone in Washington or Vermont who was raised by religious parents. Yeah. And of course, you know, you can have really extreme people who live in, you know, like Washington state or in the Northeast that, that, you know, experience a similar kind of fundamentalism as someone in Georgia or something. But, um, and of course there can be people in Georgia that are super progressive and, and, you know, don't experience anything near what, uh, a lot of people do down there, but generally speaking, you're right. You know, it is a different experience. So geographically, you're kind of saying geographically that's that makes a difference. And that ma- you know, obviously, that's that makes sense. But how is it different for you, having been a Hispanic atheist versus someone who's a Caucasian atheist? I feel like generally speaking, there are better networks of support. At the very least, there are older networks of support. That's not the same as better. I really should have started that off that way. But there are older, more extensive networks. And it's also been far more normalized in Caucasian TV. That's that's an almost racist thing to say. But it's true. Um, Like, there are atheists on TV shows that white people watch. And sure, some of them have not great personalities. I remember that there was actually a film contest um, I think it was the American atheists who had a contest where it's like, write a character who's an atheist and has a better personality than Dr. House, uh, the lady from Bones, and Sheldon. <laughs> I thought it was funny. But it's true. But they were all – so who's – is Dr. House white as well? Yeah. I know the other two are. but Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, is it that show House? See, I don't watch yeah. that show. Okay. Um, or I haven't seen it very much. Um yeah, and so like, there's no mention of like anyone who's black or anyone who's who's uh, Latino or anything like that. It's just I don't know, cookie cutter atheist or something. This is kind of going backwards a little bit, but was there anything keeping you holding on to your faith when you lost it? Anything that was bothering you in the back of your mind? Just kind of like I mean, when when I accepted that I was an atheist, no, there there were moments. The thing is, when I was first an atheist. There was nothing holding me back subconsciously, but I, I did want to be wrong. I wrote and I wrote about atheism because atheism was the most logical conclusion to me, and it was the most honest, given the things that I thought about and the way that I looked at the evidence presented to me. I realized that being an atheist was the only way I could be intellectually honest. Yeah. But I did want, and I know of atheists who still want for there to be, they want to be wrong. They want the universe to have God. They want God to be there watching over everyone. And that makes sense. But that doesn't mean that that's not something that's going to be holding me back. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. And um, do you think that uh, Christians misunderstand the reason that you're no longer a Christian? I was very bad at communicating about atheism when I first became an atheist, which I think is to be expected. And I think it's normal for everyone. This isn't something it's like, oh, I'm Hispanic and that's why. I just think that that's the way that it is for a lot of people who want to communicate about atheism. I didn't do a very good job of communicating what atheism was at first. So there were people who misunderstood me in the beginning. In what ways? I couldn't communicate very effectively the difference between being agnostic and being an atheist. That was one of the things, because I'm an agnostic atheist, 
but I didn't I didn't really understand that these two positions were different that they were answering different questions. So when people would ask me to explain, like people people would be curious and I did want to serve as a resource because for a lot of people, I was the first vocal atheist they had ever met. So they had questions. They're just like, what What does it mean to be an atheist? I didn't communicate that very okay, effectively. Okay, so you didn't communicate it very well, but what, didn't they mis- what did they misunderstand about you? They thought that I was saying that God does not exist. Okay, and, you, and what your point was is like, I don't know if he doesn't exist, but... My position is, as far as I can tell, there's no serious reason to believe in a god, but I don't have a belief that I, – I'm lacking a belief that he doesn't exist. My position's neutral, not just flat-out denial. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a lot of atheists. So in this, in this entire process from – you know, when you were young and you were, you know, exposed to Catholicism and, and Christianity and what about you during that entire time stayed the same? So that that's a big transition to go from, you know, being in a community that's fairly devout, you know, um, you made you made it clear that Latin America, it's it's not, you know, if you're too extreme, that's not, a you know, you're kind of an outlier. But if you're not religious enough, that's bad, too. So you go... You go from that kind of an environment, and and then and you're reading your Bible and you pray a lot, um, and then all that stops. You know, you don't do those things anymore that you used to do. What about you stayed the same through that entire time? The thing that stayed the same for me was that I valued honesty, and I valued seeking the truth. My entire life, I feel like at the very least, a small part of me has always been open to changing my position when I've been challenged and when I've realized that I'm probably incorrect. And I think that that's something that did contribute strongly to me eventually realizing that at some point in my life, I had stopped believing. So it was the honesty. You felt like from, you know, from your earliest days until now, you're, you're honest with questions that you encounter. Yeah. I, I want to know if it's possible for human beings to know what the truth is about the beginning of the universe about whether about questions like whether or not there is a god whether there's an objective purpose in life i want to know those answers if i can yeah well i think that's good so when you think back on the christian you what do you think about that person now i think that i was someone who was firm in my convictions even if those convictions were wrong but at the very least i wasn't someone who refused to not who refused to listen what do you like best about being an atheist or what do you like best about being an agnostic atheist i think that the on the most basic value i think that i'm happy that there isn't some hyper good or hyper evil being that there's nuances in everything and that there isn't i think this is a very important point to make there are people who point out that the christian god also created evil if the christian worldview is true whether it was indirectly through the creation of Satan and allowing Satan to exist, or consciously by, through using earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and giving cancer to children. I'm glad that I don't have to contend with that paradox in my head. Yeah, that, that was something I absolutely was grateful for. You know, when I realized, like, oh, like, I don't have to justify why bad things happen to good people. Like, they just do, you know, there's no one watching over us. Bad stuff happens. Yeah, that was a big relief for me, too. I, I resonate with that a lot. What's one thing that you have learned or experienced since you deconverted uh, that you may not have if you were still a Christian? I have consciously made an effort to highlight. I've consciously made an effort to learn about Latin Americans who aren't Christian. And this hasn't always been the most popular thing that I've done as a non-believer and as an activist, but I have consciously made efforts to remind people that it's not just atheists and Christians in Latin America, that there are Muslims, there are pagans, there's Hindus, there's Wiccans and Buddhists, and people of virtually every religion that you can imagine that still exists. There's, even if it's just a few hundred people, they exist in Latin America. 
because when I think about Latin America, I don't just think about it being Christians versus atheists. I think of our religion and our spirituality as being on a very complex spectrum that's worth acknowledging. This is a kind of off the cuff question, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot because I've been looking for a variety of guests. How do we find those people? I mean, I know there's simple answers like, well, there's a secular, you know, Latino alliance and (laughs) there's these groups set up. Yeah, absolutely. But there's a country out there, maybe in Latin America that you know of, that we don't hear from those people who are struggling with their faith or who are atheists. And maybe they can't speak out because of the government or something or because of it's such a strong religious environment. But how do we find those people? What's your what's your view on that? Or do you have any ideas on on the best way to reach out to those people? I think visibility like it's it's so simplistic and I'm I'm a child in this but my my opinion on the best activism is being visible. And I'm actually an intern at a website named Be Visible which aims to highlight which aims to improve Latin Americans careers in the United States by getting us to interact with each other and collaborate. But to me that is genuinely the best activism because there are people there are people in my family who've come to me and it's like hey I'm also I'm also a non-believer and I didn't know that there was anyone else in our family aside from this one relative who died many years ago because he was way older than us who are also atheists and I think it's I think it's really incredible that you're over here honestly kind of stretching your neck out for the sake of other people so that way they're encouraged to not hide that's cool. And I think I agree. I think that's a really good thing. Um, and the thing that 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 really uh, drives me when I think about like doing this podcast, that drives me a lot because, you know, it's a way for people to access it or access conversations from atheists who've deconverted just like they have. Um, but and being visible is a great a great way to do that. But the thing that that, you know, makes me really sad is that, you know, it's, it's, you can't reach everybody. And there's someone out there who, um, you know, I don't know how to reach or you don't know how to reach or, uh, you know, and I just, other than these groups, I just, I guess the internet changes a lot because, um, I mean, I know for you, it's been probably just a part of life your whole life, but I was probably around 12 when the internet became 12 years old, when the internet became kind of a, you know, a thing uh, that people yeah. use on a regular basis. And of course, you know, through my high school years, it became more and more significant. And, and, um, and now there's something called social media, you know, <laughs> that makes it makes it a lot easier to connect. So maybe this isn't as much of a problem. I don't know. But um, that feeling of seclusion is the worst feeling ever. And um, so being visible, maybe that's I mean, maybe that's just the best thing to do just be out there and, 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 tell people about your experience and um, do you have any other thoughts on any other things that people can do to help find these people that are out there that are. <laughs> I, I honestly think, I do think that there are better things that we can do than just be visible. But I think that on a daily basis, on a minute to minute basis, the best thing that we can do is be like, Hey, I'm over here. And if you have questions, I know the secular student Alliance what is one of my favorite secular groups they had recently had their national ask an atheist day and for me every day is ask an atheist day but i still love celebrations like this because it's just like oh hey if you've ever had any questions about atheists whether you want to message me privately or you want to message me or you want to comment on this feel free i am here and i'm open that's cool yep and that's uh, i mean Gosh, when I deconverted, it was like Dan Barker had a book out and that was it. That was before all of the like Hitchens and Dawkins and Harris sent their, had their books out. It was, I mean, just before that. But in that short period of time, I had no idea where to look. I had no idea who, who else was, a- was atheist. I was the only one I knew um, who had gone through anything like that. So um, you're right. Someone who writes a book, someone who starts a podcast, someone who is a part of a secular uh but you know latino alliance that you can find on twitter or facebook or something that's that's huge for those people because it it could be their only connection to someone who's just like them and it could be the thing that kind of keeps them hopeful and um and kind of gets them out of a rut or gets them out of that difficult circumstance so i think that's good advice and just on a quick note i have thought about um you know most of my close family knows that i'm um 
an atheist, but there's extended family and, and coworkers and things that just don't know. Um, and I, it, you know, I've, I've been thinking for a long time, like I really want to on my personal Facebook page, kind of be more transparent about, about, about it. Mm-hmm. And I just, I wonder like, what's my motivation? And I think part of it is being visible. Part of it is like what you said. I want, if there's someone else in my family who, who shares these beliefs, I want them to know they're not alone in the family. Like, Hey, there's others of us in this family that have similar beliefs, you know? Um, but also, uh, I think at a basic level, it just kind of, I just kind of want people to know where I'm at so I can just be done with it. I don't want to have to pretend I just, this is who I am. This is what I am. I just don't want to fuss around with any more, <laughs> any more like pretending and all that stuff. So, okay. So, uh, when you think about your deconversion experience, what are you most proud of? I'm proud of my ability to quickly realize, and and this is going to sound kind of mean, but I know people who struggled with this for years, and I did struggle with my doubts, but that was because at that point in time, I was still a believer. But the minute I realized that I couldn't morally be a believer anymore, I'm happy that I didn't have this internal fight with myself. I'm happy that I didn't feel guilty about it. And I'm not going to say that I'm proud of that. I feel like that's a little bit arrogant. But I am happy that I didn't fight myself. Yeah, it seemed like it was a fairly smooth transition for you. Yeah, I'm I'm glossing over a lot of things, especially because I was a very angry atheist when I first came out. My transition to becoming an atheist was easy. But my my feelings about how I was wrong my whole life and about how there are people in my life who were believers who aren't anymore, who influenced my religious beliefs. Like, I didn't feel like they lied to me, but there was a part of me that's just like, this is painful. And it's it's difficult to realize that I spent a lot of time believing something that I now think is incorrect. And if I ever become a Christian again, I know that I would feel that same way. And I just hope that if that ever happens, if I have to go through this whole thing again, I don't want to be angry. Because I did hurt a lot of people. Not a lot of people, but I hurt some of my friends who were believers because they were just they, they were challenging me on it. And then they got burned by my responses because I was very aggressive. Were you kind of looking for a fight? Like, I mean, for, like, I don't mean, like, physical fight. I mean, <laughs> are you an aggressive person, Luciano? No. <laughs> I'm ready to just punch someone in the face. I'm going to no. beat somebody up. I'm so angry. No. Um, like, I, yeah. I did. I, I still write about religion and irreligion a lot, but I feel like my tone, I'm sure there are people who would disagree with me on this, but I feel like my tone has moderated over the years. I feel like I've come to a better place where I'm just like, I was just wrong. People weren't, and the thing is, a lot of Christians, in my experience, misuse the word lie. They think that, like, if you, they basically say that if you're wrong, if you're telling someone something that's not true, you are lying to them. Yeah. That's not really the case. There's a difference between saying something that's wrong and intentionally trying to mislead someone. Right. And I feel like I didn't understand that when I first became an atheist. So, do you, you felt like you were lied to? Yeah. And how did you work through that? I mean, how did you come to the conclusion that they weren't lying? When I when I first started watching atheist videos, they I didn't talk to people. And I think that was something I, – I do think that that's the thing that ultimately made the difference for me. I think that having a community of people that I actually spoke to, I think – and there have been times when I called people – and we talked about religion and it ended with one or both of us in tears because in for a lot of people, especially for people who are raised surrounded by religion, where it just it's everything, not being part of that can be painful, especially in the beginning. Yeah. What was the most painful part of that for you? I think that the, I think it was challenging, but I think the hardest thing for me was seeing people I think that part of what I don't like, and I've made, I've written about this as well, in the community that I am in, I'm not going to say that this is universal, people will celebrate good news and they'll feel like it's appropriate to say it in the context of religious language. One really good example I can think of for this is like, to God be the glory. Someone worked their asses off. They cried, especially in college. I have multiple friends who've graduated. I'm part of a graduating class. I've seen my friends in tears 
and they won't feel like it's okay for them to brag about their accomplishments unless they have a veil of religious language. Oh, so it'll be like, oh, I did all this work, but thank God that I did all this work, which is weird to me. Yeah, you didn't feel that way as a Christian? I, I felt like the I, – I realized consciously and unconsciously that the work that I put in was what determined my success. Even if I thought that God had a plan, to me, I thought of it as like a multiple-layered thing. So it's like, okay, I have free will in the context that I can make decisions, and then I'll have – these decisions will lead me down different routes. God has knowledge of these different routes and where they end. Interesting. So to me, things like free will and – um, God knowing everything aren't contradictory or weren't contradictory. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I was kind of on the other spectrum, side of that spectrum, where I, I did think, I tried to give God credit for everything because I felt like mm-hmm. I needed him to know that I was grateful and that I understand that anything good in my life comes from him. You know, and it's almost, you almost believe that if you don't give him credit, like maybe he'll, maybe he'll, like, I don't think I would have even said this or even maybe thought this, but I think it was just a knowledge of if you don't give him credit, he might pull his blessing away or he, you know, you need to be grateful and understand where it's coming from. If you start thinking that it's you and you get too proud in the arrogant sense, um, you you know, pride comes before a fall, right? (laughs) So that was kind of how I felt about it was, you know, I need to constantly be given like a shout out to God if I do something good, you know, A on the test, score a touchdown in football. You know, it's like you got to give God credit because if you don't, then you're becoming proud and arrogant. You know, so I, that's kind of, I think, the opposite side. But it sounds like you had a much healthier understanding of, of that. So that that's I feel good. like it's because I had an awareness that like some I, I'm not going to say Africa, although I've heard people be like, oh, God gave you your keys. But that kid in Africa didn't wasn't thankful for his blessings, so he just starved to death. But like for me, I was in Central America and I wasn't in danger. I didn't like I didn't experience these conditions, but I had an awareness of them. I saw how they were affecting people. So for me to think like this hyper religious country, I, I think it was I I was very aware of my surroundings. So I realized that this doesn't make any sense. Honduras is overwhelmingly Catholic, but it's also a very poor country. So why would a more religious country suffer more than a more secular country? Yeah, there's that contradiction. It does it it doesn't make sense. So you said that you were really angry when you first became an atheist, and I actually think this is a really good thing to talk about. So how did you get over that? You said watching videos, but what do you mean? Well watching videos didn't help me get over it because watching videos is a passive thing. And for me, being passive doesn't help me process anything. I needed to be active. So when I became more involved in the secular community than just writing my own things, but actually talking to people, both people who agreed with me and people who disagreed with me, I was able to process my thoughts more. And over time, that led to me becoming less angry. Do you think that um, you were feeling a little silenced or a little like you didn't have a voice? And so by getting more active, it gave you a voice? Yeah. I mean, that that is the simplest way of looking at it. The more active I became, the healthier, the, the more opportunities I had to seriously consider the things that I was writing and the things that I was putting out online. And thus, the more not only did I improve my writing over time, I feel like my writing has improved over time. I don't know if other people would agree with me, but I've gotten a lot more practice and I've had opportunities to converse with people who agree with me and disagree with me. I haven't just been in my own echo chamber, unable to listen to people. I think that's actually a really good point. I don't think this has come up on the podcast before, but explaining to other people who are Christian or moderate or even other agnostics or atheists, why you believe what you do, how you got there that discussion, whether it be online or in person or whatever, I do think that helps people get over the feeling secluded and angry and and silenced. And I I do think there's, um, because people are listening to you, people are hearing you out, Uh, even if they disagree with you. And at the end of the day, walk away going, ah, you know, you're full of crap and I don't believe you. I don't agree with you. It, It does help because you're having to process, like you said, when you did all that writing when you got involved, you're having to process these thoughts you have and you're having to really dig in and think about why you believe what you believe. So I, and then I think if you have a reason for believing what you do, it probably 
makes you feel more comfortable in your own skin. You start feeling more like, yeah, I'm an atheist because of A, B, and C. I know it. I can rattle it off, you know, in a moment if someone asked me. So you're more comfortable with who you are and why you believe what you do. I think when you first become, when someone first becomes an atheist, there's probably, um, you know, you've made the right decision, but you don't have it all smoothed out yet. You don't have it all worked out yet. So maybe that's where some of the anger comes from. I think that's definitely a part of it. And for me, I'm well aware of the fact that I've never lived in a place where religion wasn't not only normalized, but even almost legislated to a certain extent. Even in Colombia, there have been theocratic politicians. Like, it's a secular state, but so is the United States. We still have theocratic politicians everywhere. So for me, I feel like maybe if I had been raised in California where religion was, even though religion still accepted, still normalized, it's not as influential my feelings probably wouldn't have been as extreme. Yeah. So is there anything that we haven't discussed that you want to share about your experience? We've talked about a lot, but um, is there anything that didn't come up that you think is important that you want people to know? I wanted to talk about this when we talked about English media. And I think that this is something that's really important to say. Media in Latin America and Latin American media produced in the United States is getting better. There's a TV show on Netflix called One Day at a Time that has a character that is agnostic. And she is actually the protagonist of the entire series. And to me, that that genuinely blew my mind because she's a veteran. She's a mother. She she's this is this incredible human being who's not broken at all. She's not a vicious person. She's not an unpleasant person. She's also an agnostic. And that is probably the best representation of an atheist or agnostic character that I've ever seen in my entire life. Wow, that's cool. It's called One Day at a Time? Yeah, and the character's name is Penelope. She is she's a Cuban-American mother who's also a veteran. That's really cool. That is super diverse. A vet, a mom, Cuban-American. That's cool. And it's just, is it a TV series or is what kind of uh, genre is it? It's a sitcom and it's on Netflix, so you can't watch it on like traditional TV. And I, I highly recommend it. There's only one, unfortunately, there's only one episode where it's actually talked about. But the episode's really, it's really emotional. And when I saw it, I actually, I had, I had goosebumps because like I knew what it was leading up to. And my girlfriend, my girlfriend who watched the entire show in one sitting, came up to me after she had finished it. And she's like, "You need to watch this." And to both of us, is like this is this is kind of emotional for us because we've never seen such positive representation of not just agnostics, but of like Latin American agnostics, yeah, yeah and female at, at, at that. You know, I mean, they did a good job of really trying to represent a diverse, you know, character. Yeah, that's cool. Well, um, as you know, I started this podcast for the recently deconverted Christian. What encouragement or piece of guidance would you give that person? I have my own podcast, and I mentioned this on the very first episode. I don't think that there has ever been a better time in the United States to be a non-believer. And that's not to say that things are easy. That's not to say that we are, that we're treated just like everyone else, because we're not. But we're getting there. But the only reason we're getting there is because of people like you, people like me, and people like our friends who are working as atheist activists and as non-believing activists who are out there fighting the good fight. I'm not going to encourage any recently deconverted person to necessarily become an activist because I'm well aware of the risks that we take being public people. But I am going to tell anyone who will listen to me for this long (laughs) that there's hope and that there's a community out there for all of us. What are one or two resources that you would recommend for someone deconverting, and specifically uh, for Latin American or Hispanic people who are deconverting? My Spanish isn't very good, but because of the diversity of my experience as someone who has lived in South, Central, and North America, and as someone who is well aware of the history of Latin America and the culture, if there is a Latin American person out there who is on the fence or has deconverted and wants to reach out to someone to know that they're not alone, I would recommend that they send me an email, that they join the Secular Latino Alliance, and that they 
get ready to be welcomed into a family that's going to welcome them. So the Secular Latino Alliance, of course, we mentioned at the beginning the Hispanic – is it Hispanic Freethinkers? It's Hispanic American Freethinkers. Okay. And then actually I think another resource is that um, you know that sitcom might be something that you know encourages people one day at a time. That's on Netflix. Um, any Any other resources you can think of? When I think of a resource, I'm just like I'm willing to be a friend – and someone that people can listen to, someone that people can email, that they can talk to. But for me, that was all I needed. So the reality okay. is I don't know what other people need. If okay. other people need groups, Secular Latino Alliance, incredible group. Uh, people need blogs. There's my blog, which is Sin God. There is The Latin Nun, which is run by my co-host. Um, and there's one of the other ones, which is the blog of the person that I disagreed with, is De Avanzada, and it's from Skeptic Inc., okay. which is, he's a Colombian writer. He, I like his writing. We disagreed on this one thing, but he's a good person. Cool. So um, I'll put all this in the in the show notes so people can can uh, look this stuff up. How do you spell Latin nun? How do they spell that? It's L A T I, and then capital N, no space, just capital N O N E. Okay, Latin so, and that's Latin. a blog. Yes. Okay, and then the last guy you mentioned was ske- was skeptic. Was that um, the the bigger group is Skeptic Inc. Inc. Okay. And the blog is De Avanzada. I'll send you an email after this, so that way you can have all of it. I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you then? I I would recommend my Facebook page, which is The Hispanic Atheist. Okay. All right, perfect. Well, um, Luciano, thank you so much. It's really – it's been fun getting to know you, and I really appreciate you reaching out. And, and of course, all you did to try to spread the word about the podcast is awesome and um, – you know, for the reasons we talked about, being visible is so important. And so I appreciate you trying to, you know, get word about the podcast out, but also for being a resource for Hispanic atheists and being someone who's visible yourself. And, um, you know, you have a blog and a, and a podcast. And what's the name of your podcast again? The podcast is The Benito Juarez Experience. All right. And you're going to email that to me because I don't speak Spanish. Yep. <laughs> and I have no idea how to spell that. So awesome. Well, no, it's been a pleasure getting to meet you and get to know you. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for listening to Voices of Deconversion. Be sure to join us next time by subscribing to the podcast. If you'd like to learn more, check out our newsletter at bodpodcast.com. <laughs>